Hey, everybody. Michael Snyder, Pacific Northwest and California Weather Watch. Today is December 20th and doing a little nighttime edition here of the latest December 2024 and so update. Uh, we'll take a detailed look here at some of what uh, drives these weather patterns across the planet and we'll take a look at our extended new climate prediction center forecast for the rest of the winter and on in through the spring months. We'll take a look at some fun stuff off through the extended here as well. We are still uh, technically in La Nina watch and this is where we measure those ENSO conditions to determine if we were in neutral El Nino or La Nina conditions. 120 west to 170 plus or minus 5 across the equatorial regions and we're going to learn why those matter. Uh, now, taking a look at that key monitoring region, this was for November of 2024. We are cooler than normal across the equatorial Pacific. And why this matters here is because it changes up the pattern across Pacific Ocean. And of course, the biggest ocean in the world here. And we get a lot of tropical heat building up across some of the maritime continent and portions of the Western Pacific. And that changes the wave tr uh, train uh, function downstream. We get ridges and troughs based on just what the ocean is doing. And I'll go over that in more detail here in a moment. But we also look at the Southern Oscillation Index pressure patterns. We measure the difference between Tahiti and Darwin. We've been doing that for a long time, and that can tell us uh, what uh, phase the atmosphere is currently in. And uh, so this graphic over here is quite nice. The, the ENSO here, the bigger ship, you know, this works on a seasonal scale. The Madden Julian Oscillation works on a one to two month scale here as well. So there's not just ENSO going on. There's other things going on as well. The Madden Julian Oscillation. There's also uh, the the stratospheric polar vortex also comes into play here as well, and things like the the quasi biennial oscillation. We'll go over that here in a moment as well. But again, other things are going on. The Madden Julian oscillation is an area of tropical convection that moves across the equatorial Pacific about every 30 to 60 days or so, and this can mimic La Nina slash La Nina conditions. It can work in phase and tandem with it, or it can be interfering with that as well. So. Uh, something like the uh, the stratospheric polar vortex here, it, it, we there's this is not well understood in forecasting. I need to point that out right away. So when you hear people talk about it, we are still in the infancy of the science regarding that. So uh, based on whether we're in a westerly QBO versus La Nino or westerly versus El Nino and whatnot, still we are not gaining much skill in our extended forecast based on whether the stratospheric polar vortex breaks down and we get southern, southern, sudden stratospheric warming events as well. And if we take a look at things right now, this is the median stratospheric polar vortex right now. So we're above average strength wise here. And so it's kind of interesting to look at this stuff here, but I'm going to show you some data on there here right now showing that as far as stratospheric warmings and breakdowns in the stratospheric polar vortex is about as successful as a normal seven to 10 day weather forecast. Uh, we are, we don't understand it quite that well yet. It's not that predictable uh, uh, far ahead of time. There are people, very smart people, working on their PhDs, trying to figure this stuff out here, and hopefully we'll have a better uh, grasp of that to come in the future. Now, taking a look here at the MJO uh, versus the ENSO, and you can kind of see how they are both, they can be both in phase, both in phase dry or wet, and then they can be out of phase, one wet, one dry. So you can kind of see how uh, you get the interseasonal variability here based on Madden Julian oscillation versus ENSO, which is La Nina slash El Nino. Uh, moving on here. So now La Nina watch is in effect. We have dropped this down to about a 59% chance here where those neutral odds are still creeping up on us. The, the latest westerly uh, weekly, sorry, was a negative 0.6 degrees Celsius, technically starting to cross the La Nina threshold, but the chances of a strong La Nina are exceedingly small. And then we're probably going back to neutral as we go on in through uh, the spring time period coming up here. And uh, but we're still kind of leaning towards weak and short lived La Nina conditions, as you see. Now, again, La Nina watch currently uh, negative 0.6, so we just kind of moved in there towards La Nina. So now looking across uh, the planet here, as far as the Madden Julian oscillation, cloud and wind patterns, again, there's that tropical convection moving across the equatorial regions here. And we base this on things like 200 millibar winds and 850 millibar winds. So way up in the atmosphere in about 5,000 feet, it's kind of convoluted as well. It's not a great predictor, but it can kind of give you a heads up on when storm activity is going to come. You can kind of see how as the Madden Julian oscillation moves across Pacific, you kind of get that jet extension across Pacific as well. And then it comes back 
back around the planet here and the jet retracts back across portions of Asia. And of course, that affects how the Rossby wave train moves downstream. And El Nino and La Nina also affect this jet stream position as well. So if we take a look at that, again, you can kind of see the ridges versus troughs, and ridging troughs, and it's just kind of this balancing act that the Earth can never win. And again, the La Nina, uh, as I've mentioned in videos before, if you've seen, the high pressure out here over the Pacific Ocean is tend to, uh, what's, what tend to bring our uh, northwest flow into the Pacific Northwest. You know, get a stronger jet stream off of Asia here. We get the warmer water building up there and the cooler water across the equatorial Pacific. And we drive those trade winds and we get the stronger jet stream. And we tend to bring ridging out over the Pacific, which tends to bring the more variable jet stream back into the Pacific Northwest. And again, kind of showing you that graphic here uh, as well. But if we take a look at where we were last winter, we were in technically uh, El Nino conditions here. It wasn't a strong El Nino, but you can see it right there. Running timeline, there's January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and now we are in December 2024. You can see how those equatorial waters definitely have cooled off. So we're still kind of trending towards that very weak La Nina coming up. And again, there's the weekly trend at negative 0.6, but you notice it just recently dropped below that threshold. It's kind of been struggling around here in the ENSO condition, uh, intro, ENSO neutral conditions. And if we take a look at this, look at all other La Ninas. By this point, we're in La Nina, virtually everyone except maybe one right there. So previous La Ninas over the last 73 years were usually there by now. So uh, the models keep showing us dropping back down. And we currently are just into that threshold, but it's very close. So this is not a strong La Nina. And if we take a look here as we go through December, 59%, but neutral conditions probably coming up here. And then you can see as we go on and towards the summertime, you can see, you know, pretty close to odds on the next winter being a, a La Nina or a, a El Nino coming up here. And who knows, we may, may remain in the neutral conditions as well. So again, 59% chance the official forecast came out there on December 12th. You can see where we've been. You can see our triple dip La Nina 20 to 21, 21 to 22, 22 to 23. And then we went through the El Nino last year and now we are trying to get down towards La Nina right now, but it, we are on a slow go of it as I showed you. Now, looking at the European, for this is for December. You can see the cold tongue out here, probably weak La Nina conditions. It continues to show it. And for January 2025 as well, you can see the Hawaiian Islands there. There's Australia and Washington, Oregon, up to the top right of the screen there. Now, this is for uh, February here as well. You kind of see the La Nina conditions there and then waning by the time we get towards March. And this is where we are the last 30 days. It stops on December 19th. It starts back up again there for November 20th. Uh, again, there's the monitoring regions here. An exceptional worldwide ocean warp is in play right now. So, again, it does resemble, does kind of look like La Nina, but let's go ahead and take a look at what the atmosphere looks like here in a moment. So this is what things normally look like. we got trade winds out there. You tend to build up still more of the heat and moisture across the Western Pacific versus the Central and the East Pacific Ocean. And now the heat transfer, of course, you're getting the heat transfer from the polar region, from the equatorial regions up to the polar regions during a La Nina. You've got this all this warm water built up. You got this cooler water across the equatorial Pacific. When La Nina is in effect, you get the increased trade winds. And of course, you know, places like Siberia are cold. You can imagine that big temperature contrast and the big temperature gradient there coming off of uh, Asia. And uh, that is what powers this jet stream. But then, of course, what goes up usually comes down in the weather world here, relatively speaking anyway don't take that literally but you can see the high pressure out there across the pacific ocean with the more variable jet stream that's why we tend to get chillier and, and usually snowier winters here across pacific northwest now neutral conditions this is what's known as pacific walker circulation we tend to build still more of that convection across the western pacific ocean in la nina that gets enhanced the trade winds are stronger we push more of the sun heated water off to the western pacific ocean and create that stronger pressure gradient with the warmer water and you know cooler air across Siberia and whatnot. Now, if we look at El Nino, the reverse is true. We build up warmer water here and we weaken that temperature gradient there and we bring that out across the Pacific Ocean. That's why California at times can be wetter and a lot of the USA is tech, usually warmer during El Nino conditions. That convection is closer. The jet stream is closer to the West Coast usually. Now, 
Uh, how do we know if we're starting to show El Nino slash La Nina conditions? Well, a good way to look at it, like I mentioned earlier, is the Southern Oscillation Index. So again, this is the difference between Tahiti and Darwin. If the pressure is lower for Tahiti, you're, you're looking at El Nino conditions because you've got the clouds, you've got the moisture, you've got the rising heat, lower pressure, higher pressure here. And you can see, again, the walker circulation in action. So uh, there it is for El Nino, and the reverse is true for La Nina, lower pressure, Western Pacific, Darwin versus Tahiti, higher pressure, sinking air. Now, if we take a look at where we are right now, we are in positive, so this resembles La Nina, kind of a weak La Nina right there. But if we look at this over the last 30 days, we've been at 14, over the last 90 days, we're at 6.76, but you can see that we are climbing. So it has been a slow, steady climb. Uh, so it is kind of resembling a weak La Nina right now. And the daily contribution was actually quite positive, but that's just the daily. The 30 and the 90 day are more important. Now, this is looking back in the past a little bit. Look at the triple dip La Nina. Notice those, uh, those pressures here in the positive region. And this is where we are now. So it is hinting at a little bit of La Nina. And this is our most recent El Nino. And you can see a super El Nino way back in the 2015-16 in uh, season. Uh, now, let's go ahead and take a look at what everybody wants to see, the Climate Prediction Center Monthly Temperature Outlook. So this is for January 2025, December 19. And uh, yeah, we got equal chances across Pacific Northwest and interior areas above. But if we go on in towards January, February, March, still, they still have the signal there below normal. Are we going to flip the pattern here and start to get cooler than normal across Pacific Northwest? Above average precipitation showing up here with snow levels, snow lovers, cross your fingers. Taking a look at uh, February, March, April, still below and above here for the Pacific Northwest. And as we go March, April, May, as La Ninas tend to do, they can be chillier than normal springs with above normal precipitation. And again, we'll see how that works out. Now, something fun, I jumped way ahead to the summertime here because they put this out for, it actually goes out over a year, their, their monthly predictions here. June, July, August, look at this warm signal here for the West with below normal precipitation, maybe some good dust devil chasing coming up here. But that's not good for farmers to see because we're usually pretty dry here across Pacific Northwest during the summer. But anyway, you take that with a grain of salt. You don't worry about that at all at, that point, at this point. And if you really want to get crazy, I pointed this one out just because to show you how far out some of these forecasts go. This is November, December, and January of 2025 into 2026. And you see a little tiny sliver of above average here across western Washington. So just kind of an entertaining thing there. Now, I pointed this out before, but I'd like to go over it. This is 1950 to 2024. This is SeaTac snowfall, November through March. And if we go uh, and take a look at the key here, the, the light pink is weak La Nina. And then you got the red as moderate, and then you strong, uh, strong El Nino. Sorry, did I say El Nino? El Nino, pink is a weak El Nino. Red, moderate El Nino. Darker red, strong El Nino. So we've had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years with absolutely no snowfall since 1950. For SeaTac, every single one of those years was an El Nino year. So you can see there are some signals out there, but just because it's El Nino doesn't mean it's going not it just doesn't mean you're not going to get snow. Also, you can see we've had strong and moderate and weak El Ninos all bring snowfall, including February 2019 was technically a weak El Nino. But if you look back at La Nina, every single La Nina year going back to 1950 for SeaTac Washington that I have found in my records has measurable snowfall. So hopefully we get our chance here coming up. I always like to see snowfall. I'm always going to root for it. I know everybody doesn't love it here, but a lot of people do. So yeah. And the gray, by the way, also is the, the neutral there. So yeah, this goes all the way from a 74 year period here from 49 to 50 all the way through 2024. And you can see the exceptional uh, winter season of 68 through 69, massive snowfall in an El Nino year. And then you can see the, the pretty robust snowfall we had in December 2008 shows up right there, the snowiest month of my lifetime. And I believe that's the end of the thing there. So yeah, I'm going to do my normal briefings tomorrow. Hopefully this has been educational for you. And what else? I mean, we've got some storms rolling in here. So I will talk about those in more detail tomorrow. I know people are starting to see some stronger winds show up in some of the smartphone apps. At least I've been seeing some comments like that. But I'll talk about that in more detail tomorrow. But anyway, I hope you guys are having a good rest of your night. Um, I will talk to you guys tomorrow and I'll see you then.